have another interesting um, session tonight ahead of us. The Lord is um, going to bring us through this session tonight. Last week we look at the eternality of God. And without even planning this, we're going to realize there's a connectivity between the eternality of God and the attribute we're going to look at tonight. So far we have been doing pretty good. This subject at hand is not one that you can do in a rush. Each attribute of God carries unlimited implications and ramifications, not only for what we believe, but for how we behave, and also to understand God as he reveals himself, that no one attribute will ever capture the biblical revelation of who God is. And that's why we need to study all the attributes if we want to understand what God reveals about himself. Another important thing about studying these attributes of God, it's they, they constitute a unique study in that there will never be an update. And I, I love that because I, I, I can't afford to keep 27 different editions of the same textbook in my library. I don't have the space. Uh, we have to do that because we don't know everything at the beginning of writing. We have to do that because we are not omniscient. But when God reveals himself in his word, there's no need for an update. There's nothing in the scriptures that are not true of God, and there's nothing that will become true. True is fully revealed in the context of his holy word. So that, that's refreshing to know that the, 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 the issues at hand, the attributes of God are eternal. They consume time. They exhaust time. They embrace it time. They, they outlive time. And that is good for us because we are always learning more and more about this, this awesome God of the Christian faith as revealed in the Holy Scriptures. Again, we have a, a short listing of some attributes of God to remind us what we are studying. God is eternal. We looked at that one last week. God is holy. God is majestic. He's sovereign, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. God is good. And... Um, well, when we get to that, we'll talk about that, some more about that because it's not this, this the type of statement. The statement we make in church, God is good all the time and all the time God is good. That's not what the Bible reveals about God at all. So we get to look at what it means when the Bible says God is good. He's merciful. He's a God of love. He's gracious. He's faithful. He's awesome. He's glorious. He's great. And he's righteous. Uh, tonight, we are going to look at the attribute of love. God is love. And perhaps that attribute of God is, is, is mentioned more, and people talk more about that. The next one that I think that is adjacent to the popularity to the love of God is the power of God. Because when people find themselves in problem, they want power. They want somebody with power to help them. Uh, what is usually a little bit unknown is, of course, the holiness of God and the righteousness of God and, and the justice of God. But those are ahead of us, and we see how the Lord would lead us into that. So tonight's focus is on the love of God. And the Bible uses different words and ways to communicate God's love. Sometimes the word love, as we know it, is used. In both testaments, even though there are different words in the original, we're going to look at that in a moment. Or affection, loving affection is used, or affectionate. And sometimes loving kindness, which is a love that is expressed in a kind manner. Or kindness motivated by love. We have in that word loving kindness of God. Thy loving kindness is better than life we used to sing a chorus let's read some verses from the scriptures that support the idea that god is love the lord has appeared of us old to me saying yes i have loved you with an everlasting love therefore 
with loving kindness I have drawn you. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all the peoples on the face of the earth. Deuteronomy 7.7. 7. We are going to make some multiple reference to this verse because it's potent in dealing with the issue of God's love and his relationship with, with his people, in particular Israel. Coming to the New Testament, you perhaps heard this once or twice in your lifetime. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then we have in, this should be actually Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, if you don't write down that reference, you see there, you're not going to find it there. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is another verse I want you to keep in, in your mind because we're going to make reference to this again. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Love. Now you already know your Bible comes in two different testaments or covenants. And so you have the Old Testament, um, the 39 books of the Old Testament, and they were basically written in primarily Hebrew. Some part of them were written in a sister language called Aramic. And so we look at the Hebrew word in the Old Testament for the word translated love in our English translation. It is the Hebrew word Ahava, and it means delight, it means love, it means endear. It means a strong positive emotion of regard and affection. Another um, synonym for the word um, love is regard. If you remember, you're from the old school. Oh. If you're from the old school, you would remember in the olden days, we used to, when a, a relative visit us or we visit them, they would ask us a number of questions for other relatives. And then when they finish, no, they would say, give them my regards. That's it. Give them my love. That's another term, old term for the word love or affection, regards. So there we have the Hebrew word that is translated in the Old Testament in those passages that we have read. That would be the word you have there. Coming to the New Testament now, you're dealing with the Greek language. Um, the type of Greek that is the Bible, the New Testament is written to is called Koine Greek. There are various types of Greek that was used in, in those days. Classical Greek, Attic Greek, and Koine Greek. So we are not studying love in the Greek language in its broad historical context. We are studying the word love, and most of our studies that we do in the New Testament is restricted to the Koine Greek, the one in which the, the common Greek of the people, the street people. So those are the words we are using. And in that Koine Greek, there are usually four words for love. Four. We only look at two because only two that occur in the New Testament with any significant frequency that is worthy of study. Uh, you have storge over in Romans once or twice, and that doesn't have a collective uh, significance to the communication as much as we have these two words that we're going to be looking at tonight. Fill us, and there are other words related to it that I'm going to walk you through in a while just to get you to understand the root of that word, fill us. And the other word that we're going to be looking at, um, well, here we start with this one then. Fill us, it means to be affectionate. I thought I was going to introduce the two of them, and then, then I expound on them. But okay, let's begin with, with fill us. It means to be affectionate, having a special interest in someone. It means beloved, dear, loving, kindly towards a person. And it means to be devoted or loyal. 
That's the basic meaning of the word philos. And from that, we're going to look at a, a host. And this is where I want you to stay with me now. That root word philos uh, becomes a prefix in a lot of Greek words that, and some of them come over into our English language. And that's why I'm going to walk you through them just for you to understand the distinction between philos and the word agape that we were keeping you in suspense for towards the end of this study. So you have this word now in Greek, philagathos, and it means one who loves to do good. And there are people like that around. There are people like that around, you know, churches. There are people outside of the scope of spiritual conversion, outside the church who like to do good um, to people. Because you have to remember that God made mankind in his image and in his likeness. And in spite of sin, there are still some structural presence of God's image and likeness within man. So in other words, sometimes mankind will behave godlike, even though they are not converted, like being good to people, being kind, being affectionate. And so one who loves to do good, we would call that person uh, a philagathos. And it's a combination of two Greek words, philos, which we are working with, the prefix, and the suffix is the word agathos. And so you have a lover of doing good. If you know any lady by the name of Agatha, that's where the name comes from. Agatha, the name means to be good or to do good. So we have Philagathos, one who loves to do good, one who is motivated, one who has special interest in. See, you, 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 to stay with me, you have to remember the root meaning or the meaning of the root word Philos, to be affectionate, having special interest in someone and, and so forth, and to be devoted. So some people are devoted to doing good. They are motivated by Philagathos. Then we have another one, which you know very well, Philadelphus, from which we get our word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. The Philadelphus means brotherly love. Again, you have a combination of two Greek words, the prefix Philos we're working with, and Delphus. Delphus means brother. And so you have brotherly love, a family type of love within a context in which you're committed to one another because of link by blood and so forth, or a, a type of friendship that you value because of mutuality and reciprocity in both, both brothers or, or sisters. Then we have philandros. It's a lover of one's husband. And we have the two words there again, philos and andre, which means male. And that's why it's translated husband. This is used over in Titus. Paul um, commanded Titus that he wants the older women to teach the younger women how to philandrous their husband, to love their husband. Very interesting word. Then we have philandrous, lo loving one's husband is a repeat of it. It doesn't mean you have two husbands. That's going to create a lot of problem. We're going to be still sticking with one. Then we have another word, philagaru. Philagoros, get that right. And you can see why it's difficult to pronounce because it means the lover of money. That's where you get that word, the love of money is uh, root of all evil. What this means then is basically this. It's a type of affection that expressed, look at this now. It's a type of affection that expresses interest in money. Remember the root word? having special interest in someone? Well, when we are misguided now, rather than loving someone who bears the image of God, we love money that bears the image of man. It shows you how much all our affection has been um, distorted, damaged, ruined by sin, that we love money more than people. And this is a reality. It's translated many times in your English Bible as covetous, one who is covetous, one who will use all their relationship with other persons to, to get money. They will sell you at any cost. They will do anything with a, with a friendship, with a marriage, with, with just about anyone who comes within their close proximity. You will be used for them to gather money. 
And so that's an interesting word there, um, philagurus. And then you have philatus. And you can see at the suffix of the word, you have auto, from which you get self, uh, auto, automobile, and all these things. What does this word mean? One who loves himself or herself more than he or she ought. According to Romans chapter 12, there's a balance way in which we are to think of ourselves. And we should not think of ourselves in an inflated way uh, with an ego that is out of control. Well, believe it or not, uh, you, there are people who suffer from a high dosage of this virus. Because all these that I'm showing you, they are viral. They are viruses within the human spirit. And they are dangerous. Because someone who loves himself or herself more than they ought to, they are always going around looking for subscribers to fall down at their shrine to recognize them for more than they are. They are intoxicated with themselves and they think everyone are to be a subscriber or they become subservient to their kingdom or empire construction. And so the, the New Testament talks a lot about the believer not to think of himself more higher than he ought. There's a self-love that is healthy, balanced, that maintain a good self-image in terms of how God loves us. That's why the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. The Bible never said you ought to hate yourself, uh, but you have to love your neighbor as yourself. I think we still have some more words here. Then we have philedonos. And it means a lover of pleasure. The Bible talks about in the last days, they will be lovers of pleasure more than anything else. Well, this is what that word means. Someone who loves to have fun and pleasure, they think about that. They are motivated. They are controlled by that. Just having all different types of pleasure. In, in fact, this is the type of virus the lover of pleasure, that drive people to drugs. They are seeking and pushing the envelope to have an experience in terms of pleasure and to feel elated, elevated, or high. And so they are pushed by that virus. Philedonos, a lover of pleasure. And then you have, this one is an interesting one. You Believe it or not, you, you see the meaning on the word already, so you know it. And this is, Philotheos, and it is difficult for you to recognize it because it is in the reverse order. It is sometimes written that way, but the way you know it is Theophilus. Paul, Paul, not Paul, Luke talks about that in introducing his gospel. Okay, Theophilus, and it's written both ways. So it's a lover of God. Now, do not confuse this with believers who are commanded to love God or believers who love God. Because what you have here is philos at the root. So it's someone who has a particular interest to, to God, not necessarily the true God, but any, any God whatsoever. These are people who could be in the business of collecting idols. They are intoxicated with interest in idolatry. And so this is not the healthy form of love for God. We'll talk about that later on when we introduce the other word. And then you have... Philologos, a lover of words, perhaps somebody who is poetic or somebody who is a poet, someone who, and nothing is insane about that. You just love words, love to put words together, you're, you're a writer and, and so forth. Maybe you're involved in journalism and, and so forth and so on. But that's the combination then of two important words again in Christian um, theology, philos, which we're studying, and logos which actually is used for the reference to the Lord Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's the Logos. But this lover of word is, not, of course, not referring to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ because his, that word comes in the singular. So you have Philologos, a lover of words. Then you have Philonikos. And this one is interesting. You want to work with me? This is the one you don't want to argue about. Uh, about with me, right? I'll tell you why. Because it means a lover of contention. Remember I said most of these things are viral? Well, believe it or not, they are, they are believers, not to mention ungodly people. They are believers who, who have this virus. They suffer from a high dosage of philonikos, 
what it is they love contention some people are so contentious that if you know that they are coming in your presence or you're going in their presence you prepare yourself and you know how you prepare yourself you prepare yourself not to say a word and would you believe it that your silence is going to generate a contention how oh, you're so silent today, how oh, you're so quiet, and you're unusually quiet because you're trying to avoid a contentious person, but they usually don't get it. But yes, there are people like that. They will argue about old wife fables. Um, they will argue about things that is not edifying, but they just love contention. And you got to watch that because it will creep up on you um, easily. Any of these things, they, they are very subtle, but they are dangerous. And sometimes we misunderstand them for the authentic love. Here Paul talks about it, that he wants the, he admonished the young women to love their husbands. See, that's what he wanted older women to teach the younger women. Now listen to this while we are on this, I'll explain this to you. Because we usually say this, that we don't have any command in the New Testament for wives to love their husbands the way we have a command for husbands to love their wives. This is the closest come that we have to the Ephesian passage, which we're going to look at in a while. And the reason given, I'll show you this, agape is not found here in the Titus passage. But the one where husbands love their wives, agape is used there. Totally different. And the commands are different. And one of the reasons why they are different is because God designed, again, the male and the female differently. One is made to receive love and one is made to initiate love. And like, like I said, when I come to Agape, I'll explain that some more. So what Paul is saying he wants the older women to do is to challenge, beg, encourage, eh, admonish the younger women to be affectionate towards their husband. And only when I put both of those words on the screen, agape and philos, that you will see the distinction, and then I'll come back to this passage, why the women are to be encouraged and commanded to be affectionate towards their husband and their children, by the way, both of them. The word is used in reference to both. So we come to the other important Greek word used in the New Testament for love. And this is the word agape. Really, the form is agapao and comes over to us easy in English. You say agape love, and we know what we're talking about. And this agape love, it means love, to love. It means to esteem. And I want you to keep that definition in mind because this is the one that we tend to miss out of this type of love. It's so different from philos. This is about esteeming others esteeming the other person and loving one another it means to hold dear say a bond somebody who is important and valuable to you like a life partner and then it means also to like in a in, in a particular context you would know how to interpret that so these are the wide range meaning of the word agape what we need to do now is not so much define as to describe because that, that's how you're going to see the difference between the both. Now, Lexham Theological Word Book tells us that this verb, agapao, refers to a kind of love that expresses personal will and affection rather than emotions or feelings. You remember with Philos, it is someone who has a particular interest in the other person. Okay, like a person having interest in money or in a friend. I'm going to show you in a moment some of the dangers in those words. Now, we have in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own. This is agape now in Romans 5, 8, toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, if you do not understand the difference between philos and agape, you're going to have a problem with this statement in Romans 5, 8. That God demonstrated his love towards, his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners. Now, most believers think that God's love toward us was motivated because we believe in his son. 
God is not in trading in, in, in stocks. He doesn't visit Wall Street for that purpose. In other words, God doesn't love us as believers because we, we believe in his son. Look at that verse. His love was demonstrated towards us in that while we were still sinners. Now, when we got converted, that agape took us on. Agape took us on long before when we were enemies, while they were driving the nails and piercing his side with the sword. God's love was demonstrated. That's why Jesus could say from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. You got to keep that aspect of agape in mind while you're still sinners it's not the type of love where you trade benefits result and affection for something that we need to understand and i'm emphasizing this until i get to the ephesian passage you will hear husbands you try to explain to them that god has commanded us as husband to love our wives as christ loved the church and then some husbands would say but she don't respect me well, you see, this is agape love. The reason for it is not in the object. I'm going to clarify that for you. That's why agape is used here. The, the, the basis for this love is not because of the treatment you receive. Agape is not in trading places. No. It is not a trading item. You got to understand that, and I'll help you to understand it better. Now, let's look at this. What agape love is defined as. It's a maximum concentration, devotion of affection, expressing itself in a desire to possess and be possessed by that object. This, this is a rich definition that I read many years ago. And I tell you, I can't add to it, not, not take from it, but it makes a lot of sense. See, agape love is maximum concentration. That's why you see, brothers, there's only one way to love Christ or to love our wives as Christ loved the church. You can't have polygamy in there. You can't have more. It's maximum concentration. See why it has to be devoted and then you have devotion of affection. It can't be a type of concentrated love and devotion that's effective, that's available to all. It is concentrated on one person in a covenant binding relationship until death does part. I'm going to come back and express some more ideas about this agape love, especially when it comes in a marital uh, relationship as Paul um, commands it in Ephesians 5. So it, it, it is devotion of affection where you are committed, you are loyal to one person or group of person in a unique way that that type of loyalty and devotion and affection is not available to others. It is an exclusive commitment. And that's why it is referred to as a vow. It expresses, expresses itself in a desire to possess and be possessed. That is the element in agape love that caused jealousy. And I mean genuine, justified jealousy. Where you have a covenant relationship like with God and Israel. And then God, Israel worship other gods. Even though God said you shall have no other God beside me. And because of that they were considered to be involved in whoredom. There were uh, uh, adulterers in terms of worship and devotion to God. They were not, in an, that sense, possessing God and God possessing them. There were others who were enjoying the affection. Man-made man idols that they themselves carved out were enjoying the same type of affection and devotion they gave to the God who made them. You can understand the hideousness and the bondage and slavery of idolatry and what it does to damage the worshiper. So this, this agape love is one that is, it, it concentrates. It is, there is loyalty and devotion in its focus. And that's why you have this now in Deuteronomy 6.5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. You notice the word all? 
Didn't I just describe to you agape? And the same thing with the Old Testament word ahava. It requires devotion, concentration. Cannot be scattered all over the place where others are enjoying the same thing. All right? So here we notice the word all, maximum, devotion, commitment to. Okay? And God's agape love then could be looked upon or defined as God's outgoing concern, care, and compassion for his creatures, which expresses itself in his gracious and providential provision and protection. When God gave his son, heaven became empty. There is nothing more. And Paul says that beautifully, I think, in Romans 5. Having given us his son, there is nothing that God would ever hold back. Something that we don't seem to understand. Not, God would not hold back anything from us because it values more than Jesus Christ. He holds back things from us because he's a loving father and it's not good for us or the timing is not right. But heaven does not have anyone more valuable than the Lord Jesus Christ. So we should rest in the fact that if God has not answered our prayer or give us things that we have asked him for, it's not lack of love. In fact, it's the exact opposite. It's because he loves us. Why he can't give us serpents and we ask for bread. Or give us serpents when we ask for Because sometimes we do. We are misguided. And we do ask for these things. So this is a type of God's care and concern. That's why John 3.16 then is going to take on an added meaning at the end of this uh, session here tonight. Uh, that God so loved the world is not a statement of approval. It's the exact opposite. Now let's compare and contrast these two in a moment. Philos, which is the one we introduced first, and agape. Philos is insufficient. First thing I want to tell you about this, this Philos and whatever comes after it. The reason why it is insufficient is never satisfied. No matter how much a person loves money, they will never trade their love for money for hatred of it by saying that they have had enough. It is said of one of America's oldest and most popular multi-billionaire that on his dying bed, he was asked the question, how much more does he really want? And he said, just another dollar. And from the same family, when one of the later offspring, billionaires, when they put his remain aside and the journalists gathered to, 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 to interview the siblings, they, they want to know, what was the value of his wealth, his, his estate that he left behind? I understand one journalist asked, tell us, tell us, how much did he leave behind? And the descendant said, all, he left all. Of course, the journalists didn't expect that. They expect some, some quantifying of money they can put in the press tomorrow. But you know, that, multi-billionaire family known as the Rockefellers. They, they left the same thing that all of us going to leave. It's called all. Whether it's a coin or it's a billion dollars. When you're going, when death takes hold of our body, we leave all. Phyllis is never sufficient. Though you get all the money in the world, that's why Jesus asks that fundamental accounting question. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? You realize that if the gold and the precious stones in the world could quantify the value of one human soul, God would need to send his son from heaven. What he would have done is made more pearl and diamonds and gold. But there's no amount of diamond and gold that can equate and set the value of a human soul. So Phyllis is insufficient. Phyllis is based on the object of its affection. You realize that was the weakness in Phyllis? Well, remember how we describe it. Someone who has particular interest in, 
in money, in another person, in doing good. You see, the justification for Phyllis is always, I love you because. I like you because. Now, let me illustrate some to you quickly, how these express themselves. I love you because you're beautiful or because you're handsome. And as I prefer it, you have some. In other words, my love in my heart is awakened because of beauty in you. Because of you, you have some ham, handsomeness or you have some, you have some, you, you have some. But the reason for the love in my heart is because of the quality in the object. She's a beautiful young lady, no doubt about that. And then all of a sudden, her beauty does something to me. <laughs> Hold on to that idea there. We're coming up with that. I love you because you're rich. Now, you need to just analyze that clearly. This love that I have for you have nothing to do with you as a person. It's, it's what's in your wallet. It's what's in your bank account. Money. I love you because you're rich. Were you poor? You think I would love you? No. So guess what? You see, if you want to hold on to my love, if you want my love to continue and to sustain it and maintain it, keep your riches. For my eyes are not on you, it's on your wealth. Sound funny, but that's how it, that's fill us. It's never sufficient. I love you because you have long hair. Oh, yes, there are men who are affected by that. It's not a bad idea when God explained that you hear is long hair is given to one for her glory. But you can't enter into a lifelong relationship, make a vow with somebody because of the length of hair. Because you know already that uh, youth is fleeting passing. And the other things that go with it, go with it and glow with it. They, they have to go. But there are people whose affection is awakened. Look at this one. I love it because you're hot. Oh, yeah. You're hot. You're, 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 you're sexy, we would say. You, 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 you are, you are the, the, the person I would want to be with. But here's a problem with that. A lot of people don't really realize that it's not so much a compliment. You really don't want to have any type of commitment in a relationship with somebody who loves you as a young woman because you're hot. You know why it's not a good thing to do? I'll tell you why. Well, you get it. You won't always be hot unless you die young, which means you cold young. You get cold young. But here's the other po point why it's dangerous. If a young man loves you, has affection toward you because you're hot, you think you are the only woman in the world that's hot? Don't you realize that this guy has heat out of control? In other words, wherever there is heat, he's going to mo be motivated. That's why you have so much unfaithfulness in these relationships. People love people because of the color of their pigmentation, believe it or not. People love people because they're young. Well, you got to grow old. That's, you can't stay young. The only way to make certain the person who you love stay young is to take a good picture of them and bid them farewell. Phyllis is fragile. All these things that I love you because is fragile. If I love you because you're hot, then what about others who are hot? Can't you see I can't be loyal? Phyllis is controlled by the object of its affection. I love you because. Look at this. The reason for my loving you is, is in you. What a difference. That God's love make, different, uh, make a difference in this. Look at this. Phyllis is responsive by nature. I love you because you're beautiful. I'm responding to the beauty in you. I am actually telling you something else. I'm a victim. I'm hopeless. I'm out of control. Agape, look, look at agape now. Agape is initiative. It's an initiative by nature. God loves us. God demonstrated his love towards us while we are still sinners. For God so loved the world. When was the last time you look at the world? And especially the time when they were nailing him and stoning him. 
When the world hated him, God's love remained intact. I'll show you in a minute quickly why agape love outshines Phyllis. Phyllis is always looking for perfection. Looking for a perfect object to justify its existence and function. I love you because you're beautiful. And you'd be surprised to know how many husbands complain to their wives that they don't look as sweet and beautiful and young as when they met them. You know what the hypocrisy is? They don't use mirrors. They would realize that they don't look the same either. But relationship can be based on fleeting outlook. But that's Phyllis for you. Phyllis cannot take the marathon. Phyllis is the hundred yard dash. It's a night experience, to say the least. It cannot do the marathon. It takes something more than that. And so many times you hear this statement, very popular. If only I knew then what I know now, oh yeah, you'd have married somebody else or you would, wouldn't go into a relationship with this person. So look at Phyllis again. Phyllis is based on ignorance. You didn't know the person. You know God's love is so different. God knows everything but, but about us and he still loves us. He loves us with an everlasting love. All these things that we have listed here constitute human love on the horizontal plane. Fragile and cannot take the marathon. Now look at this. Agape is a self-sustaining love. The sustenance of agape comes from the person who is doing the loving. It comes from the lover. Now, this is so important that I wish we had time to discuss some more aspect of its application. That is why when we do premarital counseling, we don't rush to get people married until we mark them, walk them through the maze of excitement that is usually easily awakened by Phyllis. The beauty, the passion that rage war within us, the passion for sex and companionship. And it's so easy. And especially in today's world, when the female body is almost nude, then you can see how easily physical desire within the male can be awakened that can easily be misinterpreted for love that will take on the marathon journey, but it cannot sustain it. Agape is based on the subject, the lover. I love you. That's the type of love Paul commands that husbands are to express towards their wives. In other words, Christian men, we are to work on our integrity and trustworthiness. So when we make a vow, we don't walk away from it because there are changes in the object. You read over in Revelation 3 and verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear me and opens the door. Have you ever realized that that statement was made to a church where God's converted people reside? You ever look at it, who is knocking on the door? The Redeemer. The Savior who saved us, we locked him out. There are a lot of churches who have locked Christ out of the door. He's on the outside trying to come in. I've said it all the time. There are a lot of Americans, preachers, and the airways and preachers around the world. If their Bible get go blank tomorrow morning, they wouldn't even know that there are no writing in it. Because they're preaching and most of what they're doing has nothing to do with the Bible. They close it, then they speak. We don't treat God's word as a command anymore and see him as the head of the church. No, so we have this confusing type of relationship. Agape is based on the subject, the lover. Are you ready for John 3.16 then? Yes. That's the only reason why God could love our evil, wicked anti-God sinful world is because it's agape that's written in John 3 16. It is self-sustaining. It is based on who and what God is. Has nothing to do with the object except the object will enjoy the expression of it. Agape depends on the nature and character of the subject. God. Phyllis is subject oriented. 
I'm uh, sorry, Phyllis is object oriented, beautiful. The person has money, and all the different things in your culture that that you admire in the opposite number. All these things are what consistent with Phyllis. Agape now is subject. It's all about you. Can you keep your word? Are you a man of your word? Are you loyal? Are you faithful? Do you have integrity? Can you stay true to your vow when youthful smile is replaced with wrinkles? And when the person is not moving as fast and doesn't have that sex appeal that she had 40 years ago. Can you stay the marathon? See, that's where the love of God comes in. Look at the church and what the church has done to the Lord many times throughout history. He has not divorced her yet. But one day he's going to present her with a total pure washing. And she, he's going to put her on an exhibition in heaven. And he's going to dress her, yes, as his bride in white linen according to Revelation 19. So God loves us because of who and what God is. You ever thought about that? God loves us because of who and what he is. Quickly before we forget. You remember all of these attributes? That's the God that loves you. First of all, it's eternal. I'm not going to go through them. God's love is everlasting. There's nothing you can do in time to stop God from loving you. Because God is eternal. God loved you before he made the universe. There's nothing you can do to change God's love. Because it's not based on you. There's nothing you can do in time, space, and matter for God to withdraw his love. For God's love is eternal. It transcends, embraces, and endures time. Because the love, the reason for God's love is within himself. It's not in the object. Don't we understand? It never searches for a perfect object. For perfection dwell it in him alone. That's why God doesn't require us to be perfect for him to love us. You don't read in the Bible. You must be holy because I love you. No, you're holy because God is holy. Look at it. Agape love doesn't look for a perfect object because it's self-sufficient. Perfection dwelleth in God. That's why God loves me. So when you tell me about my imperfection, his love only shine brighter because it's based on who he is. His divine integrity sustain love relationship. Agape expressed is expressed towards imperfect people. It's not seeking perfection. It's not complaining how you treat me. Husbands, that's it. It's an independent love regardless of how the object. That's how I know the command to love husbands, to love wives as Christ loved the church, precedes the command to submit. How do I know that? Because agape is an initiative. It's not a response. You don't love your wife because she treats you good. You don't love your wife because she submits to you. No, agape love is an initiative. You take the initiative independent of what is returned. That's how God commands us. It's a transforming force which seeks to change other into its perfect likeness. You see the power of God's love, how it changes us, how God is patient with us and he loves us. He loves the sinner. He loves the enemy. And it's truly undeserved. God can't love you because you're beautiful. Read Romans chapter 3. There's none that seek it after God. Their mouth are open, tomb or sepulchre. There's none righteous, no, not one. And then we read in chapter 5 that God loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Dan 16 takes on a new meaning, I hope. One of my favorite writers, the old British writer called jay siddler baxter he's with the lord now he he wrote a very popular book called explore the book a survey of the bible he says love ever gives forgives and outlives and while it lives it gives for this is love's prerogative to give and give and give i close by reading this for you the love of god is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell it goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. 
the guilty peer bowed down with care god gave his son to win his erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin when years of time shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall when men who here refuse to pray and rocks and hills and mountains call god's love so sure shall still endure all measureless and strong redeeming grace to adam's race the saints an angel song i read these two stanzas and pause to tell you a quick story a minute that when this song was originally written it only had these the first two stanzas the third stanza was not written until a man in prison was led to the lord and got a copy of the hymn with the two verses and after being converted to christ in his jail cell he was thinking about the love of god that's when he added this third verse could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of god above would drain the ocean dry nor could the scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky O oh, love of god how rich and pure how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints an angel song father we love you heavenly father we appreciate you spirit of god we appreciate you son of god we appreciate you we love you and we wish we pray that one day we'll see you face to face and we would be able to love you even like you love us more love to thee O christ more love to thee in jesus name amen Say